45 today, and uh, it was, I really enjoyed diving into um, this particular psalm because there were so many different ways I could have approached it. It's called a, a wedding psalm, or sometimes it's even referred to as the wedding psalm. And, uh, you know, after surviving uh, three daughters' uh, weddings in the last, uh, in the previous few years, you know, as I'm doing my study, every time the word wedding came up, it's kind of a trigger word for me, and I felt like I should stop what I'm doing and go back and check my bank balance um, every time I read that. But uh, that, that's one angle you could go. You could also look at it as uh, a description of good government, Inter- interestingly enough, where probably looking at an election in this country. And when things are really working as they should, um, what, what's the description of God's agent um, for um, the kind of the running of things? And, and that, that is one way you could, I, I might come back to that a little bit later. But uh, going, we're going to stick with this idea of weddings, though, and kind of go off that theme. And, uh, you know, I I remember um, when we were in wedding season in our family, I remember one night Janine and Jordan were off and it was late at night and they got stuck. They were really late coming back from a meeting somewhere. And then I'm, she's like, okay, we're going to be a while. We're stuck in the 401. And I'm like, well, where were you? And they were like somewhere near the Yorkdale Center, which was pretty unusual for her to go driving in something like that in the middle of traffic. I go, what are you doing there? And she's like, oh, well, we were seeing the, linen lady. I go, we got a linen lady now? And then basically at that point I was told I shouldn't really be asking any more questions. Uh, that, was, that was what was recommended. Um, so, but I want to take a look at this whole idea of not just a wedding, but a royal, a royal wedding. And uh, at a couple of uh, recent weddings that I've performed, uh, one survivor of that wedding is here this morning. I sometimes use an illustration in the wedding where I refer to um, the uh, part in the very in everybody's wedding ceremony where, especially if it's from the Book of Common Prayer, the traditional Christian wedding ceremony, there's always this throw-in line about marriage representing the mystery of the relationship between Christ and his church. And then we just keep moving on, and nobody ever talks about that. So in a couple of recent weddings, I've used an example from the classic film Zoolander, where uh, Derek Zoolander comes into the room because he's he's donated all of this money for the school for kids who don't read good, and he thinks he's coming to see the school. And remember the scene, um, you know, if you haven't watched this, there's like an hour of your life you haven't wasted yet, but there... There's this scene where he walks in, and and in this movie, the better you look, the dumber you are somehow or something like this, and he's supposed to be the best-looking person in the world. And he sees this little model of his school, and he freaks out and has a tantrum. He says, like, what is this, a a school for ants? You know, it needs to be five times bigger than this or whatever his line is, and he smashes it up in in a tantrum. And the point being that people make the same mistake with marriage, and they they miss the fact that it actually represents something much bigger. (laughs) It represents something much bigger. So even this psalm we're going to look at is talking about a royal wedding between a king and a queen. The king and the queen. But we could get lost in those details and miss the fact that it's really talking about Christ and the church. And I'm going to jump way ahead in my message this morning, and we're going to get there immediately, and that's how we're going to look at it this morning, rather than spend a half an hour telling you how it's apples to apples in that sense. Um, So let me read Psalm 45, and then uh, I want to, uh, you know, obviously make some comments on it. So Psalm 45. My heart is stirred by a noble theme. As I recite my verses for the king, my tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. You are the most excellent of men, and your lips have been anointed with grace, since God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your side, you mighty one. Clothe yourselves with splendor and majesty. We just sang that this morning, didn't we? In your majesty, ride forth victoriously. In the cause of truth, humility, and justice, let 
your right hand achieve awesome deeds. Let your sharp arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemies. Let the nations fall beneath your feet. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. All your robes are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From palaces adorned with ivory, the music of the strings makes you glad. Daughters of kings are among your honored women. At your right hand is the royal bride in gold of Ophir. Now we move on to the description of the bride. Listen, daughter, and pay careful attention. Forget your people and your father's house. Let the bride be enthralled by your beauty. Honor him, for he is your Lord. The city of Tyre will come with a gift. People of wealth will seek your favor. All glorious is the princess within her chamber. Her gown is interwoven with gold. In embroidered garments she is led to the king. Her virgin companions follow her, those brought to be with her. Led in with joy and gladness, they enter the palace of the king. Your sons will take the place of your fathers. You will make them princes throughout the land. I will perpetuate your memory through all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. In verse 1, I'm going to come back to this opening line uh, at the end today. But uh, as, we, as we hear this, this man that's writing this hymn for this such a special occasion, it's interesting the words that he chooses. He, he's passionate about what he's about to write. You know, he says, my heart is stirred. Something's bubbling up by a noble theme. And basically, this is worth all of my skill. He's, he's giving his best effort into what he's about to try to communicate. I, I love that line, stirred by a noble theme. It makes me think of uh, the Apostle Paul's words where he says, whatever is good, whatever is pure, right? Whatever is above reproach, think on these things. This is, this is to set your, your eyes, your mind, the, your mind's eye on the most beautiful, glorious picture you could possibly, possibly think of. Um, and I want us to look at this as a prophetic and beautiful piece of poetry that's most fulfilled when we apply these words to Jesus and his church. That's what I mean where I'm going to get there quickly. We're just going to kind of go with that idea. We're, we're getting to application number 10 of 10 when we're going to look at this as giving us insight into not only who Christ is, but who we are. And, and when I say we, I mean us collectively, the Christian community, the church, the body of Christ. Um, it, but this is a noble theme. Keeping Jesus as the main focus of life is, is normal. It, it is noble. It's the greatest good that we could possibly be seeking. It's the highest thing we could be thinking about. And then secondly, to find our identity in how we are related to him, that's also the highest we could be thinking about ourselves as a community of faith and why we're even here on this earth. Um, just to keep things balanced from Zoolander, I'm going to quote from Spurgeon here. He says, uh, to find our joint identity through faith and relationship to him is our greatest good. And this is the quote, for upon the marriage of Christ to his church depends our greatest good. Depends our greatest good. So, so that the most we're going to be singing Be Thou My Vision. I cheated ahead on the song sheet. The, the greatest vision we could have of ourselves as a people of faith is here in this picture, in this relationship. He says, uh, let's, let's take a look at this groom. And I want you to imagine that uh, this is a, a description of a wedding by a play. The, the royal weddings are big TV, right? You know, that was one of the the last 50 years, one of the biggest TV moments of all time in 1980. I was at camp, and it was like, who cares? There's a wedding on. Just completely skipped it. But, you know, that was a big TV moment. So imagine that this is a description in the days of radio that 
the, that you couldn't have a higher occasion than the king marrying the, the queen here. And uh, this is a description. And you're meant, to, you're meant to be able to see this in your mind's eye. So these are beautiful descriptive words, and that's how I want you to think about them. So let's take a look at the groom first in verses 2 to 8. He says, you are the most excellent of men. Another, another translation could be most handsome. This is meant to be like the epitome of manhood here. And that word, uh, excellent, translated handsome, it's the same word used in an earlier Bible story where King David is brought in from the fields. Remember, because all of his older brothers are marched before Samuel. Nope, not him, not him, not him. That looks like God says, no, that's not him. You got any more? And they bring David in. But something people miss is that David's described as handsome and ruddy. And uh, if you look at the footnotes in a study Bible, it'll tell you that ruddy means red hair and complexion. I just wanted to add that. Normally, footnotes in a Bible aren't, like, you know, inspired, but that one is. All right? So the, the, the epitome of handsome is this red complexion, red hair. Like, so here's this. The king is described as, as, as handsome, most excellent. Um, but this groom's beauty is more than skin deep. His lips are anointed with grace. If this were written today, I suppose we would say his, uh, his Twitter feed and his Facebook posts. But in Luke chapter 4, we, uh, you can take a look in Luke chapter 4, verse 22, and it says that all spoke well. This is about Jesus. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. There's the whole fulfillment of this picture of the ultimate. Jesus, what Jesus has that famous teaching that out of the hearts of men come what's on the inside. You know, we tend to focus on the outside and it's like, you know, this sin on the inside comes out their mouths. For Jesus, what was coming out matched the inside perfectly. And people were amazed at the gracious words coming from his lips. If you take a look in uh, the next verses, you'll see why this man's words are so gracious, because God has blessed him forever. And so what's being celebrated here, you got to remember, is the ultimate picture of manhood. And how's it described? Gracious. Confident in God's choosing of him and, and his identity um, that he's God's anointed, but this graciousness coming out. No, no bully here, no, no loud mouth uh, drill sergeant yelling. This is gracious words coming from his lips. And it's also a glorious king, humble enough to acknowledge where his glory really comes from. He, he, he is gracious because God has blessed him so much. Verse 3 says, Gird your sword to your side, you mighty one. Clothe yourselves with splendor and majesty. That sounds a little lock and load. Like, you know, it's weird. It's, it's a wedding. Make sure you're packing your sword for this wedding. Like, is this meant, is, it, is he like also security? What's going on here? You know, it does sound a little bit militaristic. But I, I did a little research this weekend in it, ancient Near Eastern customs. This is pretty much wedding garb for the king. All of these descriptions, they are meant to highlight you are the man here at this wedding. This is what's going to mark him out as a groom, you know. You you know all those bad pictures from the 70s where the groom's the the dude in the completely white suit while all of his friends are in beauty powder blue tuxedos, you know. And it, it's like meant to be able to show who who's the focus here, this sword. But it's also a sign of authority. This isn't just any sword. This would be an important um kind of, uh, uh, I forget what the word is here, uh, like not, not a sword using for hacking away at people, but a, but a very symbolic. This is the king's sword. It marks him out for who he is. Um, that's, that's what we see here. But it also, um, everything here is about authority and power and glory, all being heaped on this, this one. When we love Jesus, we desire his person, his righteousness, his power to be vindicated, proclaimed for everybody to be able to see him for who he really is. You know, that, that's the picture that we're looking here. And, and everything, if you go, go down through, it, it's all, um, we, we love him because of this authority, and it gives us great joy to see that increased because that authority is the fuel 
by which everything eventually is going to be made right. You know, when the world is finally completely remade and re and and re- his righteousness is reestablished, his kingdom comes in full. It's going to be at the basis of this authority. So it's not just wow, look at how much authority this one has. It, we have a vested interest in the glory of Christ's authority. All of the talk here involves symbols of authority. The ceremonial sword, the majestic garments, the uh, majestic clothing. He's told to, uh, um, in majesty, ride forth. If you uh, take a look in the book of Revelation, Jesus rides a charger. I just want to mention that. You know, if he wants to have authority, he's shown in a charger, not a Chrysler 300, Bob, a charger. And he says he has sharp arrows. He has sharp arrows. That that sounds militaristic because it also says here, you know, let your sharp arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemy. Um, you know, it's like phew, we see him firing off and the enemy's dropping. But the, the, the appearance of this power is supposed to just melt the hearts of his enemies. Like, it's over. He, he's got all of the authority. And, and again, to... This seems like Spurgeon Sunday. This is for Scotty. I've got two Spurgeon quotes in a, in a week. Um, Charles Spurgeon says this about um, his arrows. I just got to find it. Okay. He says, arrows of judicial wrath are sharp. So we tend to think of Jesus, this, the king with his arrows, and, and being all kind of uh, against his enemies. Spurgeon says, the arrows of judicial wrath are sharp. Arrows of provincial goodness are sharper still. Arrows of subduing grace are sharpest of all. The quiver of the Almighty is full of these. What's what's Charles saying there? He's saying that Jesus isn't just a marksman of judgment, but he's also one of grace. You know, has your heart been pierced by God's grace? These are the arrows of the great and mighty king. These are also described as sharp arrows. They're arrows that are for a purpose. You know, Jesus doesn't pack rubber darts. He, he, his authority is for a purpose. Um, and we come out um, for the better when Christ's authority comes down. Before I move on, roll, roll, roll back to verse 7. It says, you love righteousness and hate wickedness. There's something that this king hates. We could say God hates. We could say Jesus hates. We could say the ideal man hates. Um, And that's maybe not all that palatable in our kind of era of tolerance, but it appears that God approves of this message. Because what does it say after you hate You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions. So there's something about this attitude that this king has that God is lifting up here. Jesus' hatred of sin is for the greater good. Everything that we could praise and exalt him for is connected with that purity and that focus, and that righteousness. It's not just an unfortunate quirk in an otherwise excellent guy. You know, you know, Jesus is pretty good, except, man, he really has a hate on for sin. No, this is all part of his righteousness. Um, I could go on, but uh, I want to get on. There's somebody else here in this wedding, isn't there? The leading lady, the royal bride. And remember, I'm not looking at this psalm here today to primarily to define manhood and womanhood and and Jesus, and uh, our husbands and wives, or king and queen. I'm looking here at Christ and all of the rest of us. So this is the part where we now are going to find our combined ad- identity. Um, the, if, this is, if this church that's described here, in this metaphor of the queen, is a beautiful church, then let's take a look at how this beauty is described. What, what makes it up? What will it look like for us as a church to continue to grow in beauty? In 1990, the uh, Northern Pikes uh, had a breakout hit here in Canada that's the song they're most famous for still, and the tagline is, she ain't pretty, she just looks that way. 
And uh, there's a metaphor here for the church just waiting to happen, you know, where we can look great on the outside, but then on the inside, nah, not so much, not so much. Um, I read a, a quote from a guy this week who said, uh, you know, people sometimes say to me, yeah, but Jesus never married. He says, what are you talking about? Jesus had the most high-maintenance bride ever for over 2,000 years, you know, the church. So how does the psalmist describe this ideal? We, we don't want to be the Baptist version of she ain't pretty, she just looks that way. So what, what does this beauty, what does this beauty, what is he describing here? It's far more than just classic wedding garb. First thing, he tells her to listen. He says, listen, daughter, and pay careful attention. Again, the Apostle Paul's pretty famous for saying that faith comes through hearing. When have you really listened to God's Word? What's your, what's your state? How, what kind of a mindset are you in when you're really listening? Remember, it's more than just an auditory uh, reaction to vibrating eardrums. Janine sent me off to uh, have my uh, hear, hearing tested a couple of years ago. And unfortunately, I passed with flying colors, so the problem lay elsewhere. But, you know, he says, listen, hear. He says, forget your people and your father's house. What's that all about? Man, I remember, I remember when the Facebook names got changed from Blackman to whatever other name. We're talking like within minutes after the wedding. I'm like, oh, talk about arrows to the heart. But here, here in this passage, he's talking about the fact, church, that this new relationship that we've entered into has boundaries. It changes your relationship loyalties. You know, I don't subscribe to the uh, paranoia that uh, a married person can't have friendships with people of the opposite sex. But after Janine and I drove away from that reception 35 years ago, there were changes. There were changes to respect in all of our other relationships, not just with men and women friends, but with our own parents, with our siblings, it, all. Uh, sometimes I, I talked last week about Abraham's covenant and all the animals divided and the people walking through. I thought that would be a new twist on a wedding ceremony to, to uh, gut all these animals. Well, sometimes I thought, we, at our church we have the giant tug-of-war rope, right? We've used it here at the Sunday School Picnic. And sometimes in a church ceremony I think I should bring that out while I'm doing the ceremony and just before I pronounce them husband and wife, just kind of go around and make a circle around this couple with this big rope and say, at the end of this day, today, something has changed. This relationship now within this circle, um, you know, has boundaries. It, it, it's going to take a while to adjust to that, but just, just that picture. Well, the same thing here. He, he says that we're to leave behind um, other things. Again, this is Spurgeon's quote number three. He says in a long passage that I'd summarize this way, we not only have a lot to learn as disciples, we have plenty to forget as well. And he says this, and the unlearning is so difficult that only diligent hearing and considering and bending of the whole soul to it can accomplish the work. Even these would be too feeble did not divine grace assist. Well, that's a... 200-year-old way to say these are big changes, conscious changes. As a church, this becomes our defining relationships. It doesn't mean these other relationships no longer exist. It isn't like burning bridges and have nothing to do with people, but it's this conscious change. There's a term around my extended family called the beauty budget. And obviously, I'm not the one making withdrawals on a beauty budget, but, but what Spurgeon's hinting on here is that the kind of beauty to adorn this bride comes with great effort. It's not all natural beauty. It, it's nurtured with difficulty and needs much of the Holy Spirit's makeover skills. Being a beautiful church is a discipline to practice. I thought of us at Renaissance. We, we might have a beautiful building now. I mean, we certainly do, especially compared to the uh, dump it was before three years ago. And, and you know, having that portable done, we, we actually even don't no longer have just a good side. 
like before the portable was done. Looks great, but there's definitely, you know, curb appeal, but, you know, you got around to the backside. Now that that's even changed, and it's beautiful. But it's, it's meant to be much more than that. A beautiful church is talking about our relationships to the Savior and with one another and what they communicate. Otherwise, like I say, we're just a church version of she ain't pretty. She just looks that way. But a quick course correction right now. I thought of this as I was working on this sermon. To whose eyes, whose eyes are we thinking about when we think about being beautiful? Beautiful to who? Now that question and how you answer that has a huge effect on, to use a really lousy expression that goes around, how we do church. There are a lot of disagreements that end up coming up because it's like, remember back in verse 10? We left them behind. Our beauty isn't meant to capture their approval or their admiration. It's meant for one, the king. Remember him? That was at the beginning of our passage. Um, but look at verse 12. When she has herself looking right for him, the world is pictured in verse 12 as recognizing her beauty in a roundabout way. The city of Tyre, they're outsiders. And they're pictured here in this beautiful metaphor of bringing her gifts. They, they, they recognize something about this. And they're bringing her gifts. It says that, that the... What, what are the actual words here? Um, something about the wealthy seeking her. Like, that's the power brokers of the world. And there's something about her beauty where people are saying, can I ask you a question? I want to know more about this. So, so this beauty does have an effect on those on the outside, but it's really meant for his gaze, not for theirs. The second half of verse 13 and the first half of 14, it is about the dress, all about the dress after all. And there's the description here of her garments and how she's dressed. Wedding dresses are interesting, aren't they? They're the most expensive dress most people will ever buy, but they don't get much wear out of it. I had three daughters. It could have been perfect. Like, just only worn once. Easily could have gone through three people. Like, if their bicycles were hand-me-downs, why not this one thing, you know? And also, when you think about wedding dresses, they seem to have a pretty, uh, a pretty, I wanted to say wide girth, but that's not the right word. They, they have, a, a, there are no boundaries to how over the top a wedding dress can be in its extravagance. You know, there, there's something that they wouldn't wear. I mean, I remember Jordan's. Beautiful little Jordan. Janine and I went off to Buffalo to bring her wedding dress back. We needed an SUV with the seats folded down to fit that sucker in the back. It's not the kind of thing that she would ever wear any other time. It, there seems to be no limit. What, what's all that about? Is it, isn't that kind of wasteful? Is that all vanity? Is that too over the top? Are we just making too much of a deal about appearances? Well, in this passage, it all depends on who it's for. There's no extravagance spared on this dress because it's for the presentation to the king. That's the gaze. You know that the, the, in a wedding, it's, it, guys, are, guys kind of are in a bit of a no-win situation, you know. Most of us aren't all that demonstrative about our affection or anything. And the poor sucker, he's standing up there at the front, and he's been there already for a while. Then there's, this, this is why, like, that, that moment where he's going to see her for the first time. We have all of these kind of traditions and superstitions around the groom not seeing the bride until the moment, right? Because that's something everybody's anticipating. Those doors at the back are supposed to open. She's supposed to show up in the SUV-sized dress. And everybody's going to look at her, and they're all going to go, oh. And then what are they going to do? They're all going to turn this way because they're looking to see what his reaction is. And the poor guy up there, <laughs> that's what I mean. He's in a tough situation. You know, he's got he's to react somehow. Everybody's looking for that. But that's this moment. That's why there's no expense spared on this dress. It, it's called, it says that it's interwoven with gold in, in embroidered garments. It, it speaks of not just of beauty, but being dressed for a special occasion. 
kind of spectacular beauty that if you look at the description, required a village to create it. Because it's got embroidered gold and all of this stuff. You know, like, I have no idea who made Jordan's wedding dress. I just went down to David's bridal and David's bridal and picked it up when it came. We don't know who put it, but I'm telling you, somebody spent some time on this thing and material. And you know what? If we are going to grow in our beauty as a congregation, it won't all be from things that we've done. A lot of people would have laid the groundwork. A lot of people would have prayed. The beauty won't be just the, only the work of our own hands. It'll be from generations. You know, at a funeral last Thursday, Janine and I, we were in London at, uh, at a funeral, and a woman approached Janine and said, you're Jesse's mother, right? She says, I used to pray for you 19 years ago when this church was starting, and I wrote you letters. And Janine politely pretended she remembered getting those letters because she couldn't even remember getting the letters. It was so long ago. But there's that idea, right, as a church family. There were people praying and investing and long before we ever came along. It won't all be the work of our hands. And if you look at verses 14 and 15 and this entourage and being led in with joy and gladness, that's all about that moment she's brought in for the king to see. I need to keep moving. And we'll come back to the wedding motif in a moment. Verse 16 and 17, if we fast forward, this union's meant to be productive. And it has been and it will be in this Christ-church relationship idea. It it, it basically says, it's God's voice, I think, think, speaking, I will perpetuate your memory through all generations. And he has made Jesus' name great, the name above all names. The nations have been praising him and will praise him forever and ever. And it says all nations. I love that prophecy. I love the passage in the book of Revelation that talks about all of the saints around the throne from all nations. And a few years ago, it struck me, this is a vision, remember, that John's writing about. How does he know they're represented by all nations? What do you think of when you think of the ethnicity of the saints in heaven? We tend to just kind of project our own ethnic makeup and think that's what everybody's going to look like in heaven. No, it's all nations. I love that picture. I love that picture, that continuity. And that's, that's the glory, the children, the offspring. They're everywhere from all around the globe. So you may be thinking, and I'm I'm landing the plane here, you know, Pastor John, this has kind of been helpful um, in understanding that concept that gets thrown around in weddings about the mystical union between Christ and his church. But I want to leave you with this. Think about it. Think about your own wedding day. I'm betting it was a pretty vibrant memory, a big day experience. It was even possibly emotional. I read an article recently about memory, and I was telling my 86-year-old mom about this because she kept going on and on. About a week earlier, I took her down into the city, the first time she'd been in the downtown Toronto in a, in, since Justine was married a dozen years ago or so. or No, well, a while ago, dollars ago. Anyway, my mom would say, oh, that was so amazing being there. I said, you know, Mom, I read something recently where when you do something that's out of the ordinary, out of the routine of every day, it, it gets really locked in your memory. Like, we all remember going to elementary school, and you think about it, there was like hundreds and hundreds of days, and we only remember the odd day, because other than that, everything was the same. You know, we were in the same desk making the same excuses why our homework wasn't done, whatever it is, but it all gets blurred. But every once in a while, there's a vibrant memory. And I bet your wedding day is one of those memories. You know, I thought about, I thought about my own. It, we have so many vibrant memories of the days waiting up to that day. I, I can show you the ramp coming off the gardener onto the DVP where Janine and I nearly cracked up my $600 car like two days before the wedding, you know. Uh, I remember telling everybody in my hotel room the night before the wedding after the rehearsal, come on, you guys, you got to stop talking. I got to get some sleep. It's a big day tomorrow. Turned off the lights. Flick the lights back on. Get up, you guys. They're not going to sleep yet. You know, like, it, it, and I remember getting into the car after, after the ceremony's over. And, and my, my brother was driving a car. 
And we were in the back. And it was like, we did it. We sealed the deal. I mean, I needed to do that before she caught on. And I had accomplished it. And there was no turning back. And it was such an emotional day. Our relationship with Christ is like a bride and a groom. Sometimes we have a hard time, guys, remembering in this metaphor, we're part of the bride. But we know that a lot of preparation, no expense was spared. Everything about that day was planned for down to the last second. How about your anticipation, your, your, the experience you have with Christ? Your role as part of the church. Has it become like one of those days like elementary school? We're wedding planners. This experience is all wedding rehearsal. It, 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 it should have some impact on our hearts. What looks good to him? This is my last thought, I promise. What looks good to him? When are we ready? If his gaze is the one that we want, if it's his uh, heart that we're longing to capture here, well, what's his definition of attractive and beautiful? It can be difficult to be in a relationship where uh, the other person doesn't even necessarily know what they're looking for or they don't communicate it. They, they won't just come right out and say it. But God said in Micah 6.8, but he's already made it plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for in men and women. It's quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbor. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. Or another translation, Know, O people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you. To do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That speaks of confidence and anticipation and preparation. When we come to worship, let's come to worship his beauty. When we're looking for affirmation, let's, let's be, as a church, looking for God's admiration. By his definition of when you really have it going on, what is it about you that God finds attractive? He's described that. I guess my last words are, let's be beautiful. Let's be beautiful. And I think a lot of other things will take care of themselves. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that these uh, pictures of your wisdom in describing your relationship between your son and the church as the king and the queen, we see the dignity that there is in our role. We see the, um, the love and desire from the king to the queen that's there. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, renew our love for your son. Help us to uh, see ourselves in this light. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.